Thank you, thank you, Graham. Gee, what is it with us and, and showing pictures of snow? It's been a great snow year if you're a Victorian or New South Wales person. So what's uh, climate and weather? What's the difference between climate and weather? So in other words, what's the difference between a, a climate outlook and a weather forecast? Well, basically climate is about long-term averages and slight pushes or shoves one way or another from those climate drivers. So I sometimes say, look, a good example is, is climate tells you what clothes to buy. So it's winter, I'll buy some jeans and a few jumpers. But weather tells you what clothes to wear. So if you were up in Sydney yesterday, you certainly would have been in a tank top, uh, the, the Ridge Grundies and, and uh, shorts and, and a pair of thongs because it was about 34 degrees in Sydney yesterday. So the other example there, so for Geelong, September the 14th, in Geelong averages... 16 and a half, 17 degrees, and today was forecast to be to be 15. So the climate would tell you one thing, and I should say that the calendar, your 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 calendar on the wall is a is a climate model because it tells you effectively what the average climate will be. You know, it's going to be cooler in in June than it will be most of the time in uh, in January. So yeah, climate models are lots of different things. We use something slightly better than a than a calendar. And so hopefully this runs, so in terms of the climate models that we use to do the climate forecasting, uh, we've heard about POANA, but it's really just the, the nastiest predictive ocean atmosphere model for Australia. And these are big, as Dale showed, big uh, dynamical, big things based on physics and mathematics. But the reality is what they do is they generate weather. So this is from the climate model going through every day. It actually for does a forecast every day out for in this case, nine months ahead. But not just weather in the atmosphere, but also in the ocean as well. It might be subtle, but you can see eddies and, uh, and currents and so forth in the, in the oceans as well. So basically, we run this model, this, this physics of the atmosphere and the oceans and also of the ice and, and even land processes like soil moisture and so on. Um, some models even have chemistry within them, and so you can look at how different gases in the atmosphere may change uh, over time, say, as uh, like in the Northern Hemisphere when the, the, the trees lose their leaves or gain the leaves, that changes the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and you can actually see it wobbling up and down. So these models are quite complex, they run on the big supercomputers, um, they cost many millions of dollars to develop and the supercomputers themselves cost tens of millions of dollars and then they're uh, costs lots and lots of power, so in other words, basically at the Bureau, the humans are irrelevant in terms of how much electricity we use, most of the electricity is actually used by our supercomputer, both running it and also keeping it cool. So we run these models out, um, but we don't just run them once, because strange as it may seem, there's not just one possible future in terms of weather, because little random things can change what may happen in the future, we actually go and run the model 165 times. So we do a forecast every day for nine months ahead and then we repeat it 165 times, just changing, just changing the starting values ever so slightly. So let's pretend that say the thermometer said to us it was 16 degrees, well we'll, we'll run it at 16, we'll run it at 16.1, we'll run it at 15.9. We'll change these variables slightly to try and pick up those potential weather states in the future. And then the proportion of these 165 that give us wet weather is effectively the seasonal outlook. So if 70% of our model run said it was going to be wet, 30% said it was going to be dry, our probability for, for uh, the season ahead will be 70%. So it's quite different to a weather forecast model, which is really just giving you these daily patterns uh, and usually only run once. So you've got your probability, so what does that actually mean? So if this is our seasonal forecast and the chance, yeah, effectively the chance, well this is our roulette wheel really, you know, the chance, we've got a roulette wheel that's been uh, changed, so it's got around about the 50-50 the chance, 50% of the slots are red and 50% are black, well, we can see in that one it fell on the red, if we uh, hopefully spin it again with the odds 60 and 40, well, we ran at that time and, oh, okay, it came, out as, it came out as red. So you're not guaranteed of the last one of, you're not guaranteed of the outcome, but you're favouring it. So hopefully this time we've got 80% red, oh, it fell on the black. 
So it's all about probability. Now, what we're really doing, or what, uh, what I think Graham said before about the reserve bank and so on, we're effectively giving you those odds that just push things a little bit in your favour. Now, last time I looked at uh, um, uh, various uh, billionaires and so on that own casinos, who we won't mention because we're being filmed, but the, they're billionaires, right? They own casinos, they only actually have a slight odds in their favour. They only have a couple of percent of the odds are in their favour, and yet they're the ones driving the Rolls Royces, the punters usually are going home on a skateboard. So, in other words, you only have to have things the odds slightly in your favour to give you a benefit in the long term. And that's what we're suggesting here, that if the odds are in your favour in the long term, you'll come out ahead. But on year to year or day to day scales, you can get the opposite of what you might expect. It's all about probability. So here is basically our seasonal outlook for, for spring. We're looking at a point here in Southwest WA. So there's your, your bar at 60% chance of being drier, uh, but there's still a 40% chance of being wetter. So you can think of that as your rule out wheel looks a bit like this one. Uh, spin it round and round it goes and, and, and where it lands, well, hopefully it'll be 60%, but really nobody knows. So in terms of the climate outlook and, and accuracy, and this is where we're talking a little bit about the difference between accuracy or skill and the confidence we have in the outlook. So on our, with our bureau maps or with our bureau outlooks, we always have these plots of skill um, these maps are basically are just saying historically, if we look at the past, how well did it do? And we can see that where it's greener, we've actually had more skills. So the, the greener the, the blob, the better we've done. But the reality is, in terms of confidence, so we know the skill where it does better historically. So if you ran the model back in 1980 and ran it in 1990 and everything, you can average how did it go. But what we actually see is that when we have strong climate drivers, such as El Nino or La Nina, so those strong, those big patterns in the Pacific Ocean that really drive our climate, we actually do better. So we actually have higher skill in those years when we have the big climate drivers. And we can see here, look, it's only subtle difference. When we have El Nino and La Nina, we do overall on average a bit better for Australia, but certainly many of the individual events that have the highest values are when we have the strongest climate drivers. When we have an El Nino, we tend to do very well. When we have a La Nina, we tend to do quite well. Uh, and when we don't have much of a signal at all, we tend to have more, things tend to, to come back down to the pack and we uh, don't do as well. Although we still do better than guessing. And so I guess last year, last year was a good example in Victoria at the very least. Um, I had the joy going up to Berkshire a few times during the year and talking with the cropping group up there. But in April, when, we, when I visited and I dry sowing and so on, so Berkshire here in the, in the Wimmera Mallee, um, it was pretty hard to walk around literally with the, your boots bringing up the dust, trying to tell them that the seasonal outlook was actually generally favouring wetter than normal conditions. And we were able to say to them, look, you know, the, the IOD, the, the pattern in the Indian Ocean that favours or, or doesn't favour rainfall for Australia, but the Indian Ocean pattern is really favouring wet conditions for Australia. And ultimately, even though you know, you're kicking up dust, you're finding it a bit hard to tell them it's going to actually, I reckon it's going to get wetter. Um, it did, of course, become wetter during the winter months through, uh, through uh, large parts of Australia, largely driven by that Indian Ocean pattern and a very strong signal that that was given. Oh, there was a lesser signal from the, lesser signal from the uh, Pacific Ocean, although it was at the end of an El Nino and typically that, um, Typically at the end of an El Nino you get wetter conditions, surprisingly enough. And sure enough, back there in, in September and the mozzies just about, actually I was there a little later as well, in November, in November the mozzies were just about carrying me away because of the, the great conditions they had, warm and wet, and it was growing like no tomorrow. But certainly yes, the, the continuation, the forecast for the winter was for wet. And even though in Berkshire itself they didn't get a huge amount of rainfall, it certainly was a, a, a wet pattern overall. So, like I've said, you know, it was still looking at the odds, but we actually had reasonable confidence. So probably the, the skill map was at the low end, I would say, of what we expected to happen in terms of our confidence level, because those climate drivers were, were looking pretty good. 
So moving on to this year, I'll give you a quick roundup and a, a quick outlook as well for this year. Look, so far we've actually had a very, well, we had a very warm winter overall for Australia, believe it or not. It was our warmest winter on record and not just by a little bit, but quite a long way actually. Um, we beat the old record by 0.3. The old record was one plus 1.6. We got plus 1.9. To a climatologist, that's, a, that's an absolute shellacking. Bit cooler in Victoria, particularly in the nights and so on, where we had quite cool conditions with clear skies. Now, why, why was that? Well, in part, maybe it was a little bit to do with, with, uh, with it bumping up a little bit towards El Nino. It was also a bit to do with the warm conditions we had in the Indian Ocean as well. But looking forward now, so what we're seeing at the moment is, again, we're looking at this box. This is a, a box we use as a proxy for El Nino and La Nina. Looking at the box out there, it's starting to actually cool off a little bit. So it's starting to cool off, head away from what would normally drive us towards drier conditions. And most of the models are pushing a little bit on that cooler side. So again, heading slightly towards that wetter side of the chart as we, as we go into the months ahead. And in the Indian Ocean, the Indian Ocean dipole that we heard before, which is really just the difference between between the east and the west uh, of the Indian Ocean. And in some ways, this is quite a critical pattern for us. It's also a very critical pattern for the Horn of Africa, and indeed, some of the terrible droughts we've had there has been when they've had cool water off, this, uh, off the Horn of Africa. So at the moment, it's quite the opposite, though, that the, this Indian Ocean pattern is pushing us slightly towards the drier side over the next few months. So it's pushing us towards something that may give us some drier conditions. So you've got a wetter push, slightly wetter push from the Pacific, a slightly drier push from the Indian Ocean. And so our outlooks, well, first of all, for temperatures though, we've got lots of warm water around Australia, which is certainly bumping things up in the north. Uh, we've got some good skill at this time of year. We've also got some very warm water in, uh, down here in the Tasman, and that's keeping things warm for Victoria and Tassie as well. We're slightly worried about heat waves as we get into the, um, this spring and into, into summer. There's certainly high odds of having excessive heat or a number of days in the top deciles, so the top 10% of recorded temperatures, and likewise down here in Victoria and, and Tassie as well. So we're a bit worried about the heat, and that's why you might have heard a bit about the the, the slightly uh, on the dire side bushfire outlooks at the moment. Certainly seen some heat already, so on the 12th of September, or was it 14th today, it's two days ago, Mildura had Victoria's first 30 of the year, and it's actually slightly earlier than what we typically see, a couple of weeks earlier than what we typically see. Um, Sydney had its near 34 yesterday, and actually yesterday we also saw Australia's first 40 of the season up in Wyndham, so all happening at least slightly earlier than normal, so part of the reason we're a little, another reason why we're a little worried about higher temperatures this summer, and you've been hearing about the energy issues, of course, the energy people are quite worried about high temperatures too. So this was the spring outlook, remember we said something was pushing us slightly, slightly wetter, some was pushing us slightly drier, and that's certainly what we see with the outlook, looking a little bit drier out here in WA for spring, possibly a little wetter in southeast Queensland, northeast New South Wales. But I'll check my watch. Okay, I can show you the next slide. So this, this was issued late this morning. So now we're doing two outlooks a month. So I'll, I'll just mention that in the final slide. But uh, just this morning we issued our first October to December outlook. And those two competing influences, the, the the slightly wetter pattern from the Pacific, the slightly drier pattern from the Indian Ocean are certainly having a battle royale and keeping things very benign in terms of probabilities for rainfall over Australia. So in other words, there's no strong push towards exceptionally wet or exceptionally dry. It doesn't mean you automatically bet on average. You probably are better to go and look at what's sort of your typical range of rainfall at this time of year then look at things like soil moisture and the other factors, the temperature outlook and so on, to make a decision about where to go. You can see the temperatures still looking warm, particularly in the southeast and across the, the northwest half of Australia. As I just said, we're now issuing our outlooks twice a month. Eventually we'll be going to more regular outlooks again, but this is only the second time the Bureau started, since it started doing seasonal forecasting back in 1989. 
So it's only the second time we've done a, a, a two outlooks in a month. And this one will be updated, I think, on September the, September the 28th. So keep an eye out for that. The, the ones at the end of the month are generally going to be the ones I'd really trust. It's a bit like a seven-day forecast. At, at day five, if you're wanting the forecast for the footy on Saturday, you'll have a look at it. Oh, it might be wet, but you really have a close look on the Friday and, and take that as the main forecast. A bit like saying here, the end of the month will be the best. So just in summary there, uh, warm and dry winter, an early start to the bushfire season. Um, as many of you have seen now, that was generally the forecast for large parts of Australia too. Uh, the ENSO and ID are neutral, um, and we had a warm spring is favoured in the north and, and southeast as well, looking a little bit dry in the southwest, but that outlook that was issued a, an hour or two ago is suggesting that those odds are backing off. If you want to have a bit more, and I, I believe the slides will be circulated later, if you want to have a bit more of a, an education a bit more learning around how to use the Outlooks. We've put together a training module, it's free to do. Um, we did this with the uh, University Centre of Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, and there's some, some good tools there to help you learn a little more uh, about seasonal Outlooks. And that is it from me. Mm -hmm.